And welcome back to You Read John at 120. I am Jeff Cliff. Thank you very much. Uh, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as part of a computer science degree at the University of Regina. And today we're going to be talking about kind of the third part, uh, or the third video of, the, of this series uh, involving calculus. Uh, and so this is this series is not an in-depth, uh, you know, nine credit hour or 12 credit hour course on math. Uh, you only get about three videos on this topic, so I'm doing the best that I can to get across the important stuff. Uh, but uh, here it goes. Um, so for thousands of years, um, philosophers and mathematicians alike more or less universally avoided changing quantities. Uh, as we can see by, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to show up here, but this Roman numeral 3, uh, even our kind of number system uh, didn't really, uh, or wasn't really all that useful for computing uh, things that change uh, or, or things that um, uh, kind of modify or get modified or uh, are altered in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and there, there were people like Aristotle uh, who kind of viewed uh, what science was about purely in terms of uh, things that didn't change. Or so if you look at a, a, an animal, uh, you would kind of step back and see what parts of that animal were important, i.e. the parts that didn't change or the parts that were kind of shared in common with a lot of other things. And those essential parts were the real work of mathematics and science. Uh, and the changing stuff, well, it was just stuff you couldn't really model as uh, within the language that they had at, at the time, and so they may make note of it, but it wasn't regular. It wasn't rigorous, and it wasn't kind of modeled inside of their their systems of the world that they had built up until that time. And uh, with time, uh, people slowly started to realize that things that change uh, are, of course, important. Uh, by the late 17th century or so, there were people who were interested in derivatives. Uh, there were people who were interested in integration, as we spoke about in the last video. Uh, but nobody until about Isaac Newton and Leibniz, uh, by about the late 17th century, uh, had really put two and two together, uh, relating the two by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, which, again, was discussed about two videos ago. Uh, go watch that video if you haven't seen it. But before that point, you could count physical objects. So you could go one, two, three, four, five. Uh, but the kind of frame of mind was that math concerned these kinds of things. Quantities, shapes, um, kind of maybe even sounds. Uh, and it wasn't really clear how a triangle could change and, and still be the same triangle. It would probably be viewed as a different triangle if it was a slightly longer edge or something like that. Uh, they would frame it in terms of different objects, different kinds of things rather than the same thing changing. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out, kind of before about the 17th century, that uh, timekeeping devices, although they existed, uh, were a lot more primitive than what we would have today. Uh, they certainly didn't have digital watches or iPhones that told you exactly to atomic precision what time it is. I mean, even Big Ben, the big clock that everyone kind of thinks of when they think about clocks, uh, wasn't built yet. It wouldn't be built for almost another hundred years. Uh, and uh, Robert Hooke, uh, one of Newton's kind of adversaries and peers, uh, with along with Huygens, was still developing new kinds of clocks using new kinds of pendulums at the time that calculus was invented. And there's probably good reason that the development of clocks and the de de development of things that could keep accurate time kind of came very close to the invention of calculus. Because at that point, it was started to become increasingly possible and cheap to time things and to time rates and to calculate exact speeds, or at least closer to exact speeds than uh, people had been able to calculate in the past. And so as our understanding of time changed, our understanding of change also changed. And a derivative is a rate of change. This v over dx symbol, it specifies or it talks about something that is changing, i.e. changing in terms of a variable x in this case. Uh, it is specifically an instantaneous rate of change. Uh, the process of finding a derivative is called differentiation. Uh, the reverse pro process is called integrating. 
But uh, again, the important thing to get across in this video is we're talking about things that change. We're talking about uh, the, the parts of the system that don't necessarily stand still or don't necessarily stay the same shape or if, you know, whatever area of mathematics you're, you're looking into, there's something in it that's changing or capable of change and that is what derivatives are going to be interested in. So you probably remember from high school that you can have a, a slope of a line, and that lines all have slope. Uh, you graph a line on a regular Cartesian set of coordinates, like x and y, uh, it goes from 1, 1, or 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. That you have this kind of negative 1 slope. And there's an equation that describes it. That this is the this slope equation of this line. Uh, it's something that you can derive. Maybe you've learned to derive it in high school. Uh, but the important thing to note here is that this equation is only going to be valid. Uh, if there's a difference between, uh, actually I should fly on top. Uh, X and Y, or these two points. Because if there wasn't, then this X2 minus X1 would be zero, and of course you can't have something divided by zero. And so if you're looking for the slope between smaller and smaller portions of the line, you'll notice that this equation always gives you the same slope, but it just doesn't give you an answer when you find or look for the slope of a point. And that is what a derivative is going to turn out to be. It is going to be the slope of a line that is what's called tangent to a curve at a point. So it is not the slope of a line uh, kind of given that particular point but the slope of a line that would be drawn if that line, uh, I guess, could be drawn on top of whatever point you do choose. In the case of a line, it's going to be the same line, right? So if we draw this line, and we know the slope from here to here, then if we pick a point in the middle here, well, it should have the same slope because it should the, the slope of the line never changes. It's, it's the same throughout the entire line. Uh, and so it should be the same slope no matter where we measure it. And so uh, we're, we're in order to find the slope at this point, we're drawing a new line, which just happens to go completely over top of the old one, and then picking two points on that line to tell us the slope of that line. And whatever this slope is, we're going to define as where, or anything on this particular line, that's going to be the slope of that line. This seems a little bit circular. And for the case of lines, it is a little bit circular. But it ceases to be circular when we start talking about more complicated curves. You could draw with, for example, x squared, something like a parabola here. Because at any point on this line, there's going to be what's called a tangent curve to it. That is the curve that has the same slope as this curve. I'm drawing this kind of failing me here. But this at this point, this line has the same slope as our parabola curve here. Uh, and we don't know the point at that or the, the slope at that point except by computing the slope of this line. And so we find the slope of this line, we know what the slope of this curve is at that point, and we can do that on any point in this curve. Now, of course, I haven't shown you exactly how to do that, uh, and there's going to be a lot of different ways that you can approach this. Uh, the uh, let's see. A little bit ahead of ourselves here, but uh, you can approach this from algebra. Uh, so you can uh, kind of 
do things entirely in, in terms of variables and their relationships to each other. And that's going to be the way I'm going to mostly be doing things in this video. However, you don't have to do it this way. Uh, once you get the concept of having a tangent line at a point along a curve that has the same slope as that curve, you don't have to do it with algebra. You can do it purely with geometry if geometry is your strong point. In fact, Isaac Newton, when he wrote Principia, or whatever the, the original book was, uh, he did it pretty much entirely in terms of geometry. So if you're, if you're really good at geometry, not so good at algebra, go find out Isaac Newton's book. Go pull it out from the local library. See if they have it. Because you can actually learn geometry, or learn, calcul learn calculus, and all about derivatives entirely in terms of geometry if you want. Uh, you could also learn it about or learn about it entirely in terms of probability theory and maybe games like poker. Uh, you could learn about it in terms of finance, in terms of uh, kind of what, what are called derivatives, uh, a very related concept in uh, kind of trade of options uh, and uh, kind of financial contracts. Uh, you could learn it about calculus and derivatives specifically in terms of linear algebra or matrix math or discrete math uh, or what are called epsilon delta proofs. Uh, as Bernard Bolzano did. I'm not going to get into what those are, uh, but you can view it just in terms of proofs alone, or kind of a, almost like a logic level of understanding of how change happens, and what the slope is of a, a particular curve on a purely logical level. And of course, because we're sort of now talking about proofs uh, by the Curry-Howard correspondence, as mentioned in one of the previous videos, we're talking about computer programs. So again, we're going back to the question that some people may be asking of, okay, well, we're, it's great that you're teaching us all this math, but you're a computer science guy. What does any of this have to do with computers? Well, again, uh, if you use the Curry-Howard correspondence, uh, the, there should be some kind of a corresponding uh, entity or kind of proof or, or computer program that corresponds to epsilon delta proofs. But here's the catch. Uh, nobody has yet written a paper about this. Uh, so here's an exercise for the advanced listener who actually understands calculus already and is either viewing this just to be you know, nice to me or whatever. Uh, go reformulate the entirety of calculus in terms of computer programs explicitly by the Curry-Howard correspondence uh, to epsilon delta proofs. Because nobody's done it yet, it's something that should logically be possible to do, uh, and if you do it, you'll probably be the first in the world to try. Um, so uh, when we're talking about this kind of slope and the rate of change at certain points, uh, so for example, if we're looking at this parabola, this parabola describes, say, how fast uh, a particle is traveling when you drop it. Like this cap here, you drop it, and it hits the ground. Uh, as it falls, it's picking up speed at uh, a rate proportional to x squared. Um, it's actually a plus uh, a squared a second doesn't matter. What we can kind of simplify it as is this x squared. It's going to roughly be about that kind of distance from the point where I drop it, and the speed is going to be the slope of anywhere in this or anywhere on this curve. So this tells us where the, the lid of the pen is going to be. The slope is going to be the derivative of this, or the slope at that point in the line. And when we talk about things that change, we're going to, uh, again, go back to the original philosophers who kind of thought about things that were changing, and the original kind of mathematicians who tried to think about how it could possibly work. And there were three particular scenarios that were kind of described before Newton came on the scene that governed our thinking process. The first one is, if you imagine a tortoise in a race with Achilles, a really fast guy. And the tortoise doesn't go very fast, so he, in one time period he makes a certain amount of distance. Let's say, you know, one meter. And in the same time period, Achilles comes ten meters. And then in the next time frame, Achilles, or the tortoise goes a little bit further, and Achilles goes a little bit further. And you'll notice that Achilles keeps catching up with the tortoise, but the problem is, is that no matter what time frame you pick, or as so it was told, uh, although Achilles is catching up, 
the tortoise is always going ahead a little bit. And so you can kind of view this in terms of uh, the, the kind of paradox where Achilles will never technically overcome the tortoise because over any period of time that Achilles is moving, the tortoise is also moving. And so they'll never actually kind of catch up with each other. Of course, that's ridiculous because if you've ever raced a turtle, uh, they don't move very fast. Uh, they, they kind of just kind of crawl along and you can catch up with them and pass them very easily. But if you view it purely in terms of what happens on each moment, uh, you can run into this paradox. The idea of calculus and derivatives solves this paradox uh, by use of what are called limits. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of how limits work, but it's worth pointing out that the solution to this is expressing things in terms of derivatives and in terms of rates of change. Because then you can solve problems in terms of rates of, of change and, and know exactly when Achilles is going to pass the term. I'm not going to walk through the math for that, but it's worth pointing out that this is the scenario that kind of brought us to the point where we're asking these kinds of questions. There's two other scenarios that are almost exactly the same. Uh, and the first one is uh, my ability to touch the wall. Because I move my hand towards the wall and I get halfway, and then I get halfway again, and then I get halfway again, and every time I get halfway, I'm getting only partway to the wall, right? So I can logically never get the entire way to the wall, because I'm only ever getting halfway to the wall. But of course, that's nonsense, because I just touched the wall, or at least got close enough that my electrons started interacting with it, whatever. But the, uh, the point is, is that this view of how movement works was mistaken. And it was mistaken because it didn't take rates of change, instantaneous rates of change into account. It didn't allow us to understand how motion allows us to kind of complete actions. Uh, and derivatives, when you express them in this way, do allow you to make that distinction. There is a third uh, Zeno or paradox of this kind. The three are called Zeno's paradoxes. Uh, but I'm not going to go too far into that. Uh, where are we here? So, but you should, by looking at those, those two Zeno's paradoxes, uh, notice that they sound a little bit familiar to the argument of the beard. Uh, and that's kind of intentional. Uh, and we'll get into more about that as we go. Uh, now, there, it should be pointed out, there's a couple different ways of writing derivatives or the notation for derivatives. Uh, there's the uh, Leibniz notation, which is kind of what I wrote at the top. D over dx. So if we have some function f, the first derivative of f is df over dx. If we have a second derivative of f, or f we have d squared, dx squared. And then if we have n derivatives, it looks kind of like that. Easy enough. But we can also have the f kind of up front. This is kind of its own variable, as it were. And if we have multiple, I guess, levels of slope, uh, what we're talking about is if we have a curve, the slope of that curve at every given point actually describes another curve. And then that curve also has slopes at every point defined on it. And that would be the second derivative of that original function describing the original curve. Of course, we can have as many derivatives as we want. Uh, again, as long as the range that we're talking about, or the domain and range we're talking about, the function is defined uh, and continuous. So to review from the integration video, a continuous function kind of looks like this in terms of that there's no breaks along this function. Uh, it could be uh, pointy. Uh, there should be no point where the function turns back on itself, at least until we start getting into some really advanced math. Uh, but in general, a continuous function just means that it's connected to the entire uh, domain or range that we're talking about. If we're talking about something that's not continuous, it's going to have a gap in it somewhere. Or maybe even a gap like this, where it's defined on the entire domain, 
but there's this kind of gap here between different parts of it. That would be a discontinuous uh, function. It would not necessarily have a derivative at this point. And also, uh, functions in order to have a derivative need to be what's called differentiable. Uh, I'm not going to get into what differentiable is. It's kind of a circular uh, definition. Uh, there is a, or a formal way of specifying it uh, that you don't have to necessarily be concerned with at this very moment, but just to mention it that there is something there. Uh, as far as going back to notation, so this is all still uh, Leibniz notation. It's this d over dx. Uh, if, if we're not taking the derivative in terms of x, we could be talking about d over dy, you know, d over df maybe, uh, d over d, whatever the, the variable that's changing is. The dependent, I believe it's the dependent variable at some point. But uh, that's the kind of Leibniz way of viewing things. The modern way is to use these little prime things kind of like little quotation marks. Uh, this will be the third derivative of y. This will be the first derivative of y. It's kind of easier to write, but again, you can only do this in terms of one variable, usually x, uh, if y is the defining term of x. The third way of kind of expressing derivatives is one I haven't seen very often, but it does occasionally come up. It came up in the phase uh, recent kind of research for that video, uh, and then that is just dots above y or whatever it is that you're taking the derivative of. So this will be the third derivative. This will be the second derivative, and so on. Uh, that's apparently Newton's notation. So you'd think that we'd follow it, but apparently it doesn't really make a lot of sense to follow. It doesn't give us very much advantages over other methods, so we don't tend to use it. But just so you know, there are multiple ways of expressing derivatives. Uh, the easiest, of course, to see right off the bat is this d over dt or d over dx or whatever it is. And remember, this d is not a variable. This this whole thing together is a sin single s uh, symbol, this d over dt. It means the instantaneous rate of change over this particular variable. So d f over dt is the change of f in terms of t. That's what it means. Don't try to simplify this by taking out the d, as I would have probably tried to do when I was kind of still a teenager. Uh, no, you want to keep the whole thing together. Uh, and then when you have df over dt, and you have the equation for f, you can then solve that. And again, going back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you know something, how to integrate something, you probably have a pretty good idea of how to take the derivative as well. Uh, not always, but you can get close. So what are some examples of derivatives that we can we can do? So first of all, what's the derivative of f of uh, x, or f of x is equal to zero? So what is df over dt in this case? It is zero. So zero prime is equal to zero. Easy enough. What about a constant? So like constant prime is equal to zero. Easy enough. This could be one, so one prime is equal to zero. Because one doesn't change over time. So if we draw it out, one, the function is one all the time. The slope at any point on this line is going to be zero. Rise over run, rise doesn't happen, it always stays zero. What about uh, the antiderivative of x? Going back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of this is equal to f of x, the function that corresponds with this antiderivative. This is what antiderivative means. It's a function, the derivative of which leads us to our original function that we started with. Can go back to the uh, integration video to see examples of uh, antiderivatives. There's what what's called, uh, there's a couple of rules when uh, dealing with derivatives. 
Uh, so for example, what happens if you add two functions? f of x plus g of x all prime. That's one prime here. This is equal to f of prime plus g prime. These are both derivatives of f and g respectively. Easy enough. What if you multiply these two functions by a constant? a times f of x plus b b g of x all prime. In these brackets, it doesn't matter which brackets you use, it's just a notation to specify that everything inside of here is what is the derivative is being taken of. So in this case, we have a f prime of x plus b g prime of x. So again, this is the derivative of f times a plus the derivative of g plus or times b. So again, so if f of x is, uh, say, x squared, and g of x is x, then we will know that whatever the derivative of x squared is, uh, it's going to be a times that, and whatever the derivative of x is, it's going to be b times that. And we'll get into that in a bit. What about uh, the product of two functions? So f g all prime is equal to f prime of x times g of x plus g prime of x f of x. Again, this is what's called the product rule. Uh, it's just a way of relating uh, the original functions and the derivatives of those two functions with the derivative of what happens if we multiply those two functions together. We're starting to kind of build up a repertoire of things that you can do with derivatives. This is by no means going to be a complete list, but hopefully these are things that you're going to be able to use if you encounter a function uh, so that you can kind of break it up into simple enough functions that you can then begin to solve it. So what about division? by g, all prime is going to be f prime g minus g prime f all over g squared minus. So this is a little bit complicated to remember. You may want to write this down. Uh, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of derivatives uh, and uh, integrals that you won't be able to memorize very quickly. Uh, it may be worth writing down a list. I personally have a list. It's about 30 or 40 pages of different derivatives and integrals that I have learned and proved throughout my life, uh, which is actually another point. Uh, I'm telling you these things. You, of course, don't have to believe anything that I tell you. You can go and derive most, if not all, of this stuff although you'll need limits to do some of it, or you'll need something other than what I've taught you so far in order to prove it. Um, but the, the, the point here is that uh, even with these things, uh, you know, again, don't have to believe me, you can prove it yourself, uh, but until you do so, you might want to write it down for now. Uh, there's also functions you can put inside functions, you have the g of x. You probably haven't even thought of doing that before in your life, but you could. And not only could you do that, but you could take the derivative of those functions, which turns out to be f of g of x times g prime of x. That is another uh, thing that you can do with functions. Why you would do that, I guess we'll have to find out in later videos. But it's something that you could, of course, do. That should be f prime with g of x as an argument fed into f prime times g of x prime. Now, 
Now we get to the fun part, because we have all these relationships between derivatives, but that doesn't really help you if you don't know how to solve a particular function itself. And the most common functions you're going to run into are polynomial functions. So let's say uh, x squared, as we kind of mentioned before. Derivative of x squared, 2x. Why is 2x the derivative of x squared? Because if we take the integral of 2x, x, we get x squared over 2, 2x squared over 2 plus c, plus x squared plus c. This right here is our original thing. If this was a definite integral, uh, remember this is the antiderivative minus or plus c, and it's the antiderivative that we're interested in. That is why the derivative is 2x. Of course, you wouldn't know that it's 2x without doing this integral, but that's, of course, okay. So, generally, the derivative of x n plus 1, plus 1, c, is equal to x n. Easy enough. Probably a simpler way of writing that is if you have x n or x to the n prime, you have n n minus one. That is probably the easiest thing that you're going to be able to learn of this whole video. But nevertheless, it is powerful because again, this expresses the slope at the curve expressed by this polynomial at any point in that polynomial, as long as the point is defined and continuous, which you can prove in other ways. There's also uh, the ln function. Uh, if you take its derivative, as mentioned in the last video, you get 1 over x. Well, possibly one of our and of course that relates to uh, our video of uh, involving exponential functions because one is of course just log of e x uh, and e is a special number as we've talked about before you can google to find out what e is if you want but it's not all that important in this context all that's important is that e to the x prime is equal to e to the x. It's kind of this really kind of fancy special number that allows us to take a derivative of an exponential function using it, uh, and that is the its own slope. Uh, as mentioned in the last video, if you paid attention during your trig classes, you'll find that suddenly these things are much more important and or useful because you can take the derivatives of these functions. Derivative of sine of x is cos of x. The derivative of cos of x is cosine of x. Negative sine of x. Again, these are things you probably won't be able to memorize, uh, but we, what you could do is you could write them down. And of course, engineers have books that are consistent of nothing but tables and tables and tables of integrals. And you now know that the integral is just going the other way. So you start with this, if it's or integral, you find that this is what that integral is. Which, by the way, they don't tell you into, until fairly late into the first calculus class, so you're already ahead of the game. So now you have a whole bunch of functions that you can use to calculate the area under curves. Uh, if you have the area of, of under a curve relative to its length, you can find the function of the curve itself, which is kind of a valuable thing. Uh, you can solve different kinds of derivatives, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but at least some of them. You'll recognize what a curve or what a uh, function using a derivative is if you see one in practice, even if you don't know how to solve it. Uh, it's okay to just know that that's what you're looking at. Um, so uh, now you have a whole bunch of these functions, uh, and so the, the 
uh, it's worth pointing out that derivatives are usually uh, expressed in terms of one variable. So you have d f of x, x is equal to f prime of x, and this is in terms of x. Now we could talk about variables with or yeah. derivatives in terms of other variables, uh, and you can express variable or derivatives in that way. It's a little bit more complicated than I want to get across in this video, but it's worth pointing out that there are more complicated types of derivatives, uh, some even more complicated than I've ever learned, um, and that the notation of this prime doesn't necessarily extend to all of them in the same way, uh, but there's, there's just something to think about there. So as kind of other videos in this series, it, this is related to other videos. It's related to optimization problems because you can solve optimization problems as systems of things that move and change. So if you have, for example, a, a ball on a rod that spins around, you can know how fast that ball is spinning because it, it, a derivative of uh, uh, its position is going to be its velocity. Uh, position function, that is, uh, and you can relate its velocity in terms of other things depending on what this ball and rod is attached to, uh, and so on and so forth. Engines can be described with changing states that can be described with derivatives. Heat itself can be understood in terms of the change of particles at the boundaries of particular kinds of objects and spaces. Um, so when we start talking about optimizing for things that change, we're, we're talking about something much more powerful than just optimizing for something that has to be static or that has to stay the same. It's a more powerful thing that we have access to. Uh, it's related to the different approaches video because sometimes you can view a, a problem from many angles. Literally, you can flip your view of a problem so that the curve is in one part of the, your kind of Cartesian coordinate uh, or perhaps it can go on a completely different part. And as long as it's the same curve, uh, it shouldn't matter. You're just flipping it around, just uh, kind of displaying it differently in your mind. As long as it makes the math easier, that's okay. Solve the problem of what the slope is in your particular viewpoint, and you've solved the problem. Uh, it's related to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 video because having derivatives allows you to generate and detect even more complicated patterns in data that up until that point had even been possible, uh, including some of the stuff in the 10 Ideas 50 Years video series. Um, it's related to the Yura Cockroach video because derivatives are used in biology to describe genetic drift and to describe how genes work. We can't really fully understand what a gene is and what it does without the use of derivatives and without this idea of rates of change and how rates of change are related to things at an area, like what a rate of change can do over a period of time, etc. So Darwin would have kind of built his details uh, and understanding of how evolution itself works on the back of Newton. And, uh, and certainly people who followed Darwin uh, built their view of biology based on this stuff. Yeah. So you're going to have a lot of trouble understanding biology if you don't take these lessons in and fully understand them. And we certainly would not understand how clear we differ from cockroaches without Darwin and his understanding of how evolution works. It's related to the all the data video because all the data now includes changes and changes between the data at different points of time. And anything that changes in time is now in and of itself data that can be used to correlate with other things and understand the world that we live in. It's related to circular reasoning and recursion because you can define equations like, for example, y prime prime is equal to y plus y prime times x plus x squared. And actually, this is a valid equation suddenly. It expresses an equality between the second slope of this function or this thing y in terms of its first slope and y itself. This seems a little kind of in by itself self-referential and that's okay. That's a totally valid thing to express. It's related to the analogy video because derivatives allow us to make sure that our anal analogies change with what we're actually comparing to. And so we can actually model the change between whatever it is we're talking about in terms of how that other thing changes. And as long as the slopes are the same for both of them in their respective domain, 
that means we can probably learn stuff about both, uh, depending which one we know things about. It's related to the argument from the beard, because it's a little more clear what we mean by at any point, you know, that we're asking whether we have a beard or not. We know that beards grow at a certain rate, and we can calculate based on that rate, and based on the function of how beards actually grow, how much of a beard we have. The framing of the question is different. The understanding of what a beard is and how it grows it alone is something that is different now that we understand the rate, or the difference between rate of change and the amount of growth we have. It's related to the argument from emotion, because emotion is a changing thing. You can change how you feel about something. You can go from being kind of, oh, I'm not, you know, blasé today, to being pissed off, or happy, or, or you know, depressed, or whatever. You know, emotion doesn't stay the same. It's a constantly changing thing. And you can model emotions in your emotional state much better with derivatives than you could without them. It's related to the slippery slope fallacy, because when we're talking about slippery slopes, we're talking about some slope. This slope may have a shape, and that shape may determine how fast we fall down on it. Uh, you know, that shape but certainly shapes where the vertical, what's called the vertical line test can pass. You can Google that if you don't know what that is. Uh, it's related to the alchemy video, because alchemy is what enabled Newton to see the connection between various under curves and the curves themselves that allowed us to make, or allowed him to understand the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's related to the Bayes video, because Bayes defended calculus, as I mentioned, and his results hinge on derivatives working in the way that they do. It's related to the AI and epistemology video, because we have to account for changing beliefs. Beliefs themselves change, our certain in beliefs, our kind of credibility level on what we take for granted changes with time. So we're going to have to, whatever we do to make a mind that's intelligent is going to have to take into account things that change. And it's going to do so by the use of these derivatives. Uh, it's related to the Polya video, because pretty much everything Polya talks about is related to derivatives. He never mentions it, and I believe in his book. Uh, you can double check me on that one. But it's it seems obvious that that's what he's talking about for a lot of it. And a lot of kind of what he's building up to is for you to be able to use everything that he knows and everything that he's built with derivatives, although he never, uh, as far as I know, explicitly mentions it. Although I think he does talk about calculus a couple of times. It's related to the Loveless or Lovelace video, because computing derivatives and integrals starts to become a lot of hard work. Uh, I've only shown you how to solve some of them, but I mean, it's after a while you end up with pages and pages and pages of just like substituting things in, and kind of trying to work, reformulate how the equation looks, and make it into something that you've seen before, and this, it's a lot of busy work. And so computers are something that becomes kind of, you'll want to use it after a while to solve the simpler problems, to get it to the point where you're only faced with problems that the human mind itself feels comfortable in addressing. Uh, and computers and human minds together uh, allow you to solve more kinds of problems with derivatives than without uh, computers. Uh, it's related, of course, to integrals in that uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus kind of combines the two, which let's just redraw that out again. So, so F, T, T, B, derivative, So there, there is our connection between integrals and derivatives. Uh, it's something that took a long time for us to figure out as a species. It allowed the industrial revolution to take place, as I've mentioned. And once you kind of wrap your mind around both parts of this, you're able to solve all kinds of problems that you would not normally be able to solve. You're able to model situations in ways that people who can solve problems at a better rate than you can, can understand in a more clear way. You can express your problems in a more clear way. You can get it to the point where other, even if you don't know how to solve this integral, or you don't know how to solve this derivative, you can get, you can show it to someone else, and maybe they can tell you something about your problem. They can give you details about your problem. They can show you properties of your problem in a succinct way, in a way that may allow you to address them. Not all of these are going to be solvable, but we can do a lot better than we could do without them. So, uh, what are we doing for time? Okay, let's do some more examples.
So like x to the 4 plus x to the 3 plus x to the 2 plus x to the 1 plus 1. Take the derivative of this whole thing. We've got 5x to the 4 plus 3x to the 2 plus 2x to the 1 plus 1 plus 0, uh, which we can just get rid of 0. And there's our derivative. Now, interesting to note here that there's this pattern here that we've got the 1, 2, 3, 5. Uh, this is for initially 4, this should be 3. This is what happens when you don't look what you're doing. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4. Much better. So we, we have this pattern that goes up. And if we take this derivative, we have 2 plus. 6x plus 12x squared, which is also kind of interesting. And we can generate these kind of patterns of numbers, again going back to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10 video, we're now kind of getting access to these more complicated patterns, uh, but again, this is just an example of something, a derivative you could do. Take the derivative of 1 over x, we've got 1 prime x minus x prime 1 over x squared, we can check this, negative 1, so this is 0, remember, we have negative 1 on top over x squared on the bottom, cool, right? And you can go on and on and on. And so I'm not going to show you how to apply these kind of just manipulations of, of derivatives and formulas into derivatives uh, to related rates problems. That's kind of a more advanced topic. But just know that they exist. Know that there's a way of manipulating functions to get you the derivative of that function given by the rules that are described in this video. Uh, as usual, um, I don't think anyone caught all that today, but uh, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask anywhere where this video is posted. Um, and uh, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom here uh, for you to send your Bitcoin to, um, especially if you have a lot of questions on this topic. Uh, this is something I have tutored people for money on, uh, although usually in that case you have a lot more time to describe in more detail how things actually work, um, certainly more than just three videos. Uh, and uh, hopefully you enjoy. See you next video. We'll talk to you then.